Um, I, I, uh, if I would have notes, the first line would say, say something eloquent and emotional and heartfelt about, how, uh, about being here. But I don't have notes. Um, but uh, I don't really know what to say. It's just really very, very good. Uh, you know, I mean, one hears about, you know, the matzav when one's, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a continent away. So actually being here, uh, you know, a, it was hard being away for a couple of months is uh, sort of, I mean, so I'm very, very glad to, uh, to be back. Uh, and I'll try not to abuse all the friendship and, uh, you know, and I'll uh, hopefully uh, be comprehensible uh, in these talks. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I'm, so I'm going to state a theorem that, we're not, that I'm not going to prove even at the end of the three lectures. Okay, I mean, uh, but uh, it, it will explain sort of, a, it's sort of my motivation for why I'm considering this, this kind of problems. But I'm going to pretend during the lectures that my mo motivation is entirely different. Okay, so it's, it's sort of a matter of being honest, you know, for one moment, you know. Uh, uh, you know. So, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, so everything that I'm going to talk about is going to be sort of quantitative, right? I mean, it's going to be like, you know, measuring sizes of things and stuff like that. And as a topologist, uh, you know, I mean, like many topologists, I went into topology specifically not to have to go ahead and ever look at, uh, at you know, at numbers and, you know, and stuff like that and measurements. I mean, you know, I was a student at Courant and I learned zero analysis. I mean, it was, you know, really... Uh, you know, at the time I thought it was shocking. Then I saw, found out that there were other students who also didn't learn any analysis when they were there. But uh, you know, so so. Uh, but I'll. But sort of uh, the point of view that I have is uh, something that I read in the Feynman lectures, which he attributed to Dirac, uh, which is when do you know when you can when you solve an equation. And, it, and the answer isn't when you have it in closed form and that blah, 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 right? Or that you have some algorithm and that you could compute it on a computer or things like that. The real question is, if somebody asks you a question about it, can you answer it? I mean, you know, do you know what the solutions look like? So uh, at some point or other, you know, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, I had some kind of uh, crisis of conscience in, you know, in topology and geometry, which is that there are many problems that, uh, you know, that are officially solved. There are very, very powerful theories uh, that let you answer questions, and typically the answer to a question will be yes or no. Okay, so when the answer is yes, typically it means that something or other exists. And now the question is, have you ever learned anything from this answer that you couldn't have gotten just from the Delphic Oracle, right? I mean, you know, you actually maybe did the work and you calculated and you did some spectral sequence and blah, 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 and something is equal to something else. But, if, you know, but you don't know really anything about it. So that was sort of the thing. So I, you know, and, uh, you know, at the time I would have pretended that part of my reasons were that there were techniques that worked in dimension five and do they, that we need to really understand them better if we want to make them work in lower dimensions. But the real truth is that it's not really because tachless I'm trying to solve any new problems. Really the point is that I'm going back to old theorems and old things that are, you know, that we, you know, where we know the answer, but I realize that we don't really understand it in the sense that, you know, Dirac would have, uh, cared about, right? Who cares about, you know, right? I mean, you know, you know that there exists a ground state, but you can't compute the energy, so then, you know, what, what is it that you know? So anyway, so I'm going to now um, mention a theorem. Uh, um, so there's sort of an, an old theorem of Gromov, Lawson, and uh, Stoltz. Which, and I'm not going to tell you exactly what the theorem says. I'll just tell you the structure of the theorem. It says that if M is a simply connected N-manifold and blah, 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 okay? 
in their papers, they make this, this more explicit, okay? <laughs> right? Then M has a metric <coughs> with positive scalar curvature. Okay, so this is a really excellent theorem. Okay, uh, so I'll tell you what the conclusion means, by the way. Okay, the conclusion is something you could understand. Okay, so here's M. Okay, and you know, I mean, I, I can't draw a metric because when I draw the manifold, whenever you, I draw a manifold, you always imagine the metric that, that, that's there. So there's some, the manifold is presented to you in one, in one way. Okay, simply connected is an adjective. It's something you check about that a manifold has this property. Okay, some do, some don't. Okay, nothing to do about that hypothesis. Okay, if it's not true, the theorem is false. Okay, with the rest of it. And so then there, there are sort of two different theorems. So in, for one of the blah blahs, it's sort of easy to understand. When, to be oriented means that when you go around a loop, right, and you look at what's normal to that, uh, you come back to where you started with. Okay, and you know, so when you're simply connected, then there are essentially no loops. I mean, all of the loops can be deformed to one another. So, it's, you know, there's no hypothesis of orientation, but then you could ask the same thing for two spheres inside. Okay, so in, so in the gromov lawson theorem, the, the hypothesis was that even though it's oriented from the point of view of circles, you want it to be not oriented from the point of, two, of view of two spheres. And then the theorem is that there's always such a metric. Okay. Oh, I didn't tell you what the kind of metric is. That'll be in a minute. Okay. And for Stoltz, it's the, under this kind of additional orientability condition, then there turns, about, turns out to be magic. Then you could define what's called a Dirac operator on it, and then the Dirac operator has um, characteristic classes and K-theory associated to it. You, but it doesn't really matter. It means that there's some procedure or other that you could do to the manifold, and you do a measurement, a topologically defined measurement, and if the answer to that measurement is zero, then the metric exists. And if that measurement is non-zero, there's no way such a metric could exist. Okay? So that's the nature of it, right? Two different classes of simply connected manifolds. Yeah? Yes, yes. It went without saying, but happily, you know, but it shouldn't have. Yeah, yeah. So compact, no boundary, et cetera. Okay? Okay, so now I'll just tell you the, just so, you know, just to complete, so to speak, what the theorem says, okay, the kind of metric it is is this. You look at a metric and then you look at balls, a ball of radius r, and to say that your scalar curvature is positive means that when r is sufficiently small, the volume is a little bit less than the Euclidean volume, okay? So, you know, a, that, you know, why less corresponds to positive is a sign decision that Gauss made many, many years ago, okay? All right. Uh, okay, but anyway, so that's what the theorem is, right? So if, you, if you're, you know, so we now know in some sense exactly when metrics with this, why this should be the thing that one's interested in, that's a completely different story, why you want metrics with this property. But if you want metrics with this property, then there are sort of two mechanisms, depending upon the nature of surfaces inside, that tell you about, um, about whether, or not the, you know, whether or not there is such a metric, okay? okay? It's, it, it boils down to a computation. And the computation, again, I want to emphasize it's a topologically invariant computation, you could, you, you know, however the manifold is presented to you, you do this calculation once and for all, <coughs> okay? And then, you know, and then it has these kind of implications. So now what I want to know, know is, you know, do you understand, does anyone understand the theorem? So, you know, and again, you know, immediately after the theorems were proven in the 1980s, I think, if I remember correctly, I, and I, I thought I understood it because I could have, I mean, I mean, it was brilliant, beautiful proofs. I mean, there were papers in the annals and in ACTA, you know, a, a lot of very, very nice ideas. But then when I wanted to take seriously the idea of Dirac, and the question is, can I understand really how to build such a metric? Okay, I'm going to now tell you a theorem that, uh, that's sort of work in progress. And what, that, what I'm going to tell you is true. I just don't know how sharp it is. Okay, so here's a, a theorem that's, 
uh, joint with Fedya Manin, who was Yuri Manin's grandson, uh, and uh, Zhizheng Jie, whose grandfather I don't know, <laughs> and Guliang Yu, uh, and myself. Okay, and it says the following. Uh, okay, if M, so I'm going to assume that I start off with a metric. So I start off with a, with a manifold. Okay, so G is the metric. Okay. And I'm going to assume that, okay, that at all points the curvature is at most one. So uh, if you know what curvature is, fine. And in, in a little bit, I'll tell you to ignore the hypotheses anyway. And, uh, and I'll give you the cartoon version. Okay. And the injectivity radius of G is at least one. Okay, um, and the volume of G is, let's say, V. Then the first condition, <laughs> the first part of the theorem is that, okay, okay, I guess, and assume that the gromov lawson stoltz hypothesis holds. Okay, in other words, right, that, you know, that you calculate what you need to calculate and it tells you that there should be such a metric, that there should be a positive scalar curvature metric. Okay, and what I want to now know is what is the volume of such a positive scalar curvature metric. So now, what are these two hypotheses? So, okay, so um, I'm going to draw some manifolds for you. Okay, so here's a torus. Okay, and um, okay, I could draw another torus. Okay, there's another torus. Okay, these torus uh, now a torus is always low. You could you know the usual metric. This is not the metric embedded in R three. If I think about the usual <laughs> metric, it's like R two modulo z squared, right? It's R two modulo a lattice. So then locally it has no curvature at all. Okay, and that like a ball of radius R for R really small is isometric to a Euclidean ball of radius R. Okay, so, um, you know, on the other hand, if this were a torus embedded in R3, then like at, you know, uh, then if I looked infinitesimally at like a point there, you, you know, you begin seeing saddle kinds of natures to it. Okay, and there, so then you have a phenomenon of curvature. Okay, now, so this hypothesis is saying that in the small, I don't want there to be, you know, geodesics to be spreading apart more, you know, differently than it does in Euclidean space. Basically, these, the injectivity radius condition is just, you know, here, if I take two points and I shoot in opposite directions, they meet each other pretty quickly, while here it's further apart. Okay? So here, if I looked at a ball at scale one, say, it doesn't even look topologically like a ball. Right, I mean, you know, at some macroscopic scale, it looks like a it looks like a cylinder, right? So if I want, so this hypothesis is let balls be balls, okay? That I want to be there's some fixed scale where the balls are topologically balls, and they're also in terms of the distortion of the metric, I'm not allowing it to be very distorted from the Euclidean ball, okay? That's what these two conditions mean. So if you were, for example, working in a, in a triangulated universe, this would mean that you're bounding the number of neighborhoods, the number of neighbors that any, simple, that any vertex has, or something like that. It's some kind of, you know, it's just saying that I, when I want to think about a manifold and measure how complicated it is, I don't want there to be any kind of local complications. So if there are no local complications, then the only thing that's left is volume, right? Because that's just how many local balls are there, okay? So this kind of condition, this, th these, co these conditions together are enough to tell you that you've pinned down the number of diffeomorphism type to a finite number, okay? So, um, yeah, I mean, 
the number of diffeomorphism types of manifolds with this condition is slightly super exponential in V. Okay? I mean, it's sort of like, you know, if I ask you how many trivalent graphs are there. Okay? If I have V vertices, the number grows like exponential in V log V. Right? I mean, you know, so that's sort of what happens here. I'm saying that the local structure is like trivalent graphs. I mean, it's not quite as rigid as trivalent graphs, but, you know, among friends, it's about as rigid. Okay? So there's a compact space of such things instead of just being one literal model. Okay? But, okay? You know, so this is the level of crudity. You see, this is why I went into topology. I don't care about numbers. Right? Yeah. There was a question? Yeah, yeah, but I'm not in a rush. <laughs> this is going to be the one honest thing I say, so, like, let's stretch it out. Okay, <laughs> okay yeah, all right. Okay. Then, one, there exists a positive scalar curvature metric on M with curvature at most one, injectivity radius at least one, and the volume of the new metric is O of E to the V to the one plus epsilon. Okay? So, uh, some slightly super exponential um, uh, increase in the amount of volume. Okay? And I have no reason not to believe I mean, I, I don't believe, but I don't have any reason not to believe that the truth is linear. Okay? I mean, conceivably, you just, you know, that the, the in which case you might feel that the theorem is then almost a triviality, right? You don't have to inc do that much to the metric of the manifold to do it. But now I want to give you a second part that explains that these theorems are not trivialities. Is this theorem, is this still have to be simply connected? Yes. Oh, is there a And it's that, I'm assuming that, the, that all the Gromov Lawson Stoltz hypotheses hold. Okay? And the second one is that at least in the Stoltz case, so that's the, ver that's the one where the two spheres also have this kind of orientation condition. Okay? That in that case, the, um, you know, for, for all v that's sufficiently large, okay, much bigger than zero, okay, and all recursive functions, f, a recursive, uh, what do I mean? I, I, I mean a, a genuinely computable function, okay, I, I what they call it, uh, um, you know, a total function in that universe, okay. 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 There exists MG as above. Okay. So in other words, it satisfies all the hypotheses, <laughs> right? And it has these conditions on curvature and on volume. And the inf of the soup of the volume of G sub T. Okay, so now I have to tell you what I'm doing. So I'm going to imagine there exists an M, and I guess I'll call it G0. So G0 is supposed to be, this is bad notation, it's supposed to be an element of a family, right? So this is a family of metrics. You know, all of which have this kind of condition, right? They all have, the, the, they, the, you know, they're, they're all locally you know, nice and, right? So the only thing that I'm going to be, that I measure in order to understand complexity is, um, you know, the volume, right? Because we've assumed away local complications, right? So the only global complication is sort of just how many pieces do you have, right? And after all, and have, you know, putting such a condition, we'd always feel we understand the manifold up to sort of finite amount of stuff, you know? So it feels like a good kind of thing to measure. So we want to look at the inf over all families, G sub T, of the soup, 
So G, so G, the original metric should be what it is at time zero, and G sub one should be positive scalar curvature. Okay, because after all, there is a conclusion. Oh, so one thing that I forgot to say is that spaces of is that spaces of metrics um, are connected, right? Because if I take two metrics, you know, d and d prime, t d plus one minus t d prime is a straight line connecting the metrics, okay? And then I look at these kind of things, and I could rescale all the things in between, you know, to satisfy these kind of local conditions, okay? So, the so if there exists a metric, then there also exists a family of metrics, okay? So now when I, in, you know, and, and I just told you that how to go from the metric to the family, so and if I- soup is uh, over T, right? And this is gonna be the soup over T. Right, it's the inf over families, and I'm going to look at the soup over at any time to see how hard did I have to work somewhere along the way in the course of the proof of the theorem. And the statement is that this is greater than f of v. So in other words, you give me something like 2 to the 2 to the 2 to the 2, you know, 2 to the v factorial factorial times. Okay, right, that's going to be your function, and, you know, you know, you won't have enough time during the lifetime of the universe to compute this for v equal 3, but it doesn't matter, right? I, you know, for sufficiently large volumes, okay, it's always going to be hard to actually deform the metric you start with to the, to the thing that they assert exists. Okay? Can I ask just in condition 1, you were saying that when epsilon is 0, it's true? When? In just this condition 1. Condition. No, sorry, conclusion one. I mean, this. Yeah, then the statement is that, yeah, that if you just ask, you know, you know, how complicated must such a metric be, okay, it turns out that uh, the answer is that, you know, we could understand it to some extent, okay? It's not, you know, I mean, if I would have, you know, uh, you know, if I would have said this first, right, that the deformation always goes through, you know, really super ginormously complicated metrics, then part one all of a sudden becomes, uh, you know, sort of more respectable, right? That the truth is that the, you know, at the, at the final time, it's only, it's only, you know, it's certainly less than two exponentials, right? I mean, it's slightly, it's slightly super exponential. Um, and as far as I know, the truth is that it's linear. Okay, I mean, I have no reason to believe it's, I have no good mathematical reason to know, you know, to believe nonlinear. Um, but, you know, I, I also don't believe that I will prove it, okay, you know, in the, you know within the coming decade. The as above refers to what here? Uh, uh, um, it means that there exists a Riemannian, a Riemannian metric on the manifold M. Okay, which has these kind of conditions. Okay, it, right, it has these two conditions and it has volume V. Okay, right, you can, you know, so, so if I start off with something with volume V for large enough V, I just add on them maybe a little bit more. You know, so I do change the metric. You know, there are, after all, the original metric might have been positive scalar curvature to begin with, and I didn't need the theorem in order to prove, to construct the metric. So then I can't say, you know, so I can't say no matter what the starting metric is that the positive scalar curvature one is going to be very far away, okay? But, uh, but the conclusion is that it, sort of worst case, um, worst case, you really have to go through extremely complicated uh, metrics. Yeah? Is it, is it the same M? It's the same M, yeah. It's M is fixed. Right, right. So, so yeah, so sort of the Stoltz case is what are called spin manifolds. So the spin theorem, you necessarily have this big increase. In the non-spin case, probably I could prove it in dimension six, seven, eight. You know, but I mean, I'm, there are, you know, I mean, if I was going to be talking about the theorem, then I would, you know, then I would deluge you with such details. But, you know, but so this, so there's a tension here. Between, you know, between the two parts of the theorem, right? I mean, uh, and, you know, that's what I want to talk about, right? I mean, so these are the kinds of problems that, I, that I'm basically interested in, right? I mean, you know, do there exist metrics with certain properties? Are there diffeomorphisms between things? All sorts of topological or geometric problems where 
uh, you know, where you do something or other. You might do geometrical analysis. You might do algebraic topology. Right? There are various methods uh, that, in, that indirectly uh, answer your questions. And the question is, you know, can you, you know, uh, peer into some black boxes? Okay? So, uh, so, these, so these are the theorems. And I'm not going to explain either half, unfortunately. Okay? Um, however, today's lecture and tomorrow's lecture, you know, uh, will maybe give an indication of what goes into part two. Okay? It, it's, it's sort of an analog of the mathematics that goes into part two. And then Thursday's lecture will be the analog of the mathematics that goes into part one. Okay? So now I'm going to, okay, so now I'm going to actually give today and, uh, one second. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Question. The space of metrics with the bound on the curvature and the injective terrace, is it in itself connected? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, because you could re you see, right, I mean, these two things have nothing that, they're not in any tension with each other. You just multiply your metric by a real number, and the curvature goes down, and the injectivity radius goes up. Right? So there's no tension, these don't fight against each other. They're, you know, they're conditioned in the same direction. Okay? So. You know, rescaling gets you every, everything you want, right? So it's a nice contractible space, okay? So anyway, so this is, so what I wanted, so the, the talks are actually going to be about function spaces, because function spaces are the core of algebraic topology, okay? Uh, you know, uh, as opposed to the applications of algebraic topology to other areas. So this is sort of an application. These things here are based on applications of cobordism theory to differential geometry, and I'm not going to really get to talking about cobordism or things like that. <laughs> At least I'm not planning to yet. Okay, we'll see. Okay, so, so let me, okay, so what do, al so, you know, algebraic topology, so what do you, so, you know, this is a caricature, you look at the functions from x to y, okay, and that usually, right, one just means continuous functions. Okay, right? And a typical question, right, so you might have, you look at the set of such functions. Okay, and then a typical question is you'd want to classify them to some, to some, in, in some way. And what they mean, and to an algebraic topologist, classifying functions is what's called up to homotopy. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that I have f mapping x to y, and I have g mapping x to y, and we say that uh, f <coughs> is homotopic to g means that, well, that f is f sub 0, which is in some family f sub t, such that f sub 1 is equal to g, right? Just like when we talked about metrics, that we had families of metrics, here we'll just take, imagine that we have a family of functions, okay? And, you know, I mean, there are, sometimes you put a base point, I mean, but let's see, you know, we're, again, you know, no technical details will be allowed, uh, you know, except for ones that, you know, that, that, that I'll focus on because they're the point, okay, right? I mean, it's, uh, okay, right? So this is, the, okay, and I think that everyone is, you know, kind of familiar with this, like, um, if x equals the circle and y is r2 minus the origin, right, then you, of course, know that uh, functions, in this sense, are the same thing as integers given to you by the, the winding number around the origin. 
okay, right? And this is what we teach all of our undergraduates in complex variables, okay, right? Very fu fundamental thing. It's basically such a, such a classification. And, you know, now to the algebraic topologist, you, you know, a point of view you might have is that you're looking at this is really, it's a set, okay, it's true, it's a set. And there was things that I went with, that went without saying. I could, of course, think about this as being a topological space. I don't know what to call a C zero x y or something, right? It's a topological space. And then I was doing something like studying the path components. Okay, and um, all right, and so that's fine from the abstract point of view. And then you might, and then uh, when you you know, I mean, you might make X being a circle or a higher dimensional sphere. And these are what people call the homotopy groups of the space Y when you look at these kind of deformations. And they're this enormous subject. And in fact, the way one studies higher homotopy groups is you, is you, replace, is you look at the function space from the circle into Y, and you make that into a new space, and then you iterate the construction. That's going to be your new space Y. And then you look at the maps from a lower dimensional sphere into that Y. Okay, so, right, so there's something very inductive. So you really, you know, even though you might be studying components, right, you really, behind the scenes, you know, I like to say algebraic topology is really the algebraic topology of function spaces. And it sounds like it's uh, a circular definition, but it's really an inductive definition. Okay, I mean, you know, I mean, it's not as circular as, as it sounds at first. Okay, but now, I, you know, I, I, another example is that if you're looking at maps from Sn to Sn, there's another, the answer is still the set of such f is into a one-to-one -one correspondence with z via what's called the degree of the function. And I, I'll maybe review this in a second. Okay, but now what I want to do is I want to go ahead and uh, begin asking the Dirac question, right, which is, suppose that you go ahead and do this, and there's, you know, given an x and given a y, you know, sometimes algebraic topologists succeed and sometimes they fail. It's a very advanced subject, okay? It's not necessarily so easy uh, to, do, you know, to do this. But now I want to ask, you know, try to think about the question the same way as we did, uh, you know, for manifolds and metrics, right? So firstly, I want to have a notion of what I would mean. I should have some notion of what I mean by the complexity of a function. Right, because what I want to begin doing is asking how hard is it to tell, right? So, you know, uh, right? So here, I'm, someone gives me two functions from, uh, you know, if, if I'm given two functions from the sphere to the sphere and I compute this degree thing, right? And I get the same integer, then it's supposed to be that I could find some deformation, right? So the question is, how complicated is the deformation? Okay, right, I mean, uh, Okay, so, um, okay, and you can ask the same question. I have, a, you know, I have some maps from the circle into the, into the punctured plane, right? So you could compute winding number and you might ha there might be several different ways that people compute winding numbers, right? I mean, you might compute a Cauchy integral or you might go ahead and, you know, uh, just draw some line, you know, from the origin to infinity and count the number of intersections. There's sort of a lot of different ways in which you could count winding numbers. And it's not clear that all of these have the same complexity as each other if you use them as hypotheses. Okay, and the question would be when things are equal so that the homotopy exists, how complicated is the homotopy? Okay, so one thing is I have to tell you what I mean by the complexity of a function. And it should be the kind of thing that I could maybe put into a computer in principle, right? That if I'd want to, you know, I mean, that knowing, a, you know, that a function that's not, that's not too complex shouldn't be that hard to, it doesn't need that much bit, that many bits of data uh, to put into a computer. Okay, and what that really means is that I want to know as the complexity increases, how many functions are there? Right, so this is exactly what we mean by entropy. Entropy is the measure of information in the system, right? A, you know, whatever you, you know, I mean, in dynamical entropy, you ask that in order to make a prediction, you know, 10 years into the future, how many digits of data do you, how much, what level of precision do you need at this moment, right? I mean, uh, you know, you, you fix, you know, some unit of time and you ask about such kind of thing. So entropies for me are always measures of, uh, you know, uh, you know, measures of the numbers of states of a, of, a, of a system, you know, given some amount of data. So what, so that's what, so I mean, it's just a fancy form for the idea of volume, 
right? I mean, you know, you know, uh, just, you know, you know, you pick some one scale, and I ask how many balls does it take to cover the space at that scale? Yeah, I, so I don't, yeah, yeah. I remember all the hypotheses we can do. Right, yeah. But you say that it's bigger than any. Yeah, yeah, any, any computable function, right. So you pick a computable function for large enough volumes at some point or other, it, something has to be growing. You know, the, the deformation will have to grow, okay? So, uh, yeah, no, right. So, yeah, when you do math, right, you just say that there exists a deformation, no bounds at all on, um, you know, the sizes of the objects that occur. Right? I mean, you know, right? I mean, so, right, in these definitions, when, when, so another way to say it is, right, if two things are in the same path component, right, suppose that you have a theorem that says that, I don't know, uh, you know, that Haifa and Jerusalem are in the same path component uh, of Israel. That's a wonderful theorem, okay, and it means that you could, in principle, get from Haifa to Jerusalem. But, it, you know, but it doesn't tell you how long it's going to take. It doesn't say whether you're going to be going uphill, downhill, right, you know nothing at all about it, okay? Uh, okay, so, okay. So, when I, so today's talk was supposed to be about the entropy, which is just sort of, if I'm telling you this measure of complexity, so no, no, I'm not, no more secrets, so the complexity of F will just be the Lipschitz constant of F, okay? So, so let me comment. So firstly, a function F from X to Y is L Lipschitz if um, the distance between f of x1 and f of x2 is less than or equal to L times the distance between x1 and x2. Okay? So what went without saying is that I'm imagining that x and y have metrics on them. Okay? And I'm going to also be mainly thinking about the case where X is, a finite, is, say, a finite polyhedron. Y is a finite polyhedron. Even though I say that in algebraic topology, you want Y to be a function space itself. You know, certainly while I'm among friends, I'm not going to do that. Okay? You know, so that I don't have to worry about which metric. Okay? And like I said, I'm going to be crude, right? So if I take a metric and I multiply it by 5, that's still a metric. And, you know, I'm just saying, does there exist some, some constant? So some constant might get multiplied by 5, okay, or by a fifth or whatever. Okay? So, uh, you know, so I could be crude. Okay? Now, putting in the Lipschitz constant, you know, does something for you. I wanted to say that it should be make something or other finite. So what does it mean for something to be finite, a big function space to be finite? What we really mean is that it's compact. Okay? And now you probably know this. This is the arzela ascoli theorem that we teach our undergraduates, right? That if I have maps between metric spaces, right, and, and I have a sequence of functions that converge at one point, and they're Lipschitz, then I could find a subsequence that converges. Okay? So that tells me, right, that tells me the compactness. Okay, and now if I have two, if 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 I have two functions, uh, f and g, right? Let's just imagine this case where the target is a sphere. I don't even care what the domain is. If I have f and g that are close enough, right? Then I could always do t f plus one minus t times g over the norm. Okay, so if these two things are close enough. Right? Then I could find a canonical path connecting them. So these space, so you now, now I'm asking you to trust me when the target is not a sphere, there's an analogous formula you can write down. Okay, but there is. For close enough functions, so these spaces are always locally connected. So if I'm compact and locally connected, the number of components is finite. Okay? Okay, so, so I've already told you what, enter, so now, so let's see, so this argument works if the distance between f and g is less than pi, okay, then I never, right, then the denominator, then this never goes through the origin, so the denominator makes sense, okay, so I, so now, I, I, right, so I might as well think about covering this compact set, this function space, right, if I want to just sort of, you know, uh, just apply our Zela Ascoli, right, so,
Okay, so our Zelas Coley implies that if I look at the Lipschitz L functions up to, you know, right? So Lipschitz L functions is now compact. Okay, and then I might go ahead and do this procedure. And if you do this procedure, you might increase the Lipschitz constant slightly. Okay, and you know, so if I look at the, it, within the L plus, within L plus epsilon, okay? I mean, epsilon might be L if you're not careful, but it doesn't really matter. has finitely many components. Okay, right? Right, I mean, remember, it's locally connected, right? So, you know, I pick a scale for, say, balls of, you know, of size pi, right? And when you have a compact thing, you cover it by balls of finite pi, you find a finite subcover, right? So there are only going to be finitely many components, right? So, so now the, you know, so the, now my first question is, how well do we understand our Zela Scoli, maybe, or, you know, right? I mean, I didn't do anything hard anywhere, you know, in all of these arguments. The question is, how many components are there? So yeah, those Lipschitz functions, is Lipschitz constant is between L and L plus? Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, well, I mean, the, yeah, you look at the, so, yeah, but I mean, you should think Lipschitz, li whenever I write L, it really means less than or equal to L. Okay, I mean, I mean, because that's, you know, you could always make functions more complicated if you want. Okay, right, so I said the thing is L Lipschitz meant that I had this, so I don't have to, you know, uh, worry about the equality. Okay, so anyway, so the first thing is, you know, so, right, I mean, in other words, so, and, and my notion is, right, and this is, of course, this is, of course, bounded by what I was calling the entropy or the volume, right? It's bounded by the number of pi balls that cover the L Lipschitz function space. Okay? Okay. So now let me just make a little bit of some comments. Firstly, it is the case that the L Lipschitz functions, no, no, the Lipschitz functions from x to y are dense in the set of functions from x to y, okay? And it's, in fact, the inclusion is a homotopy equivalent. So to the algebraic topologist, you know, looking at Lipschitz functions versus looking at C0 functions, it's the same thing to the algebraic topologist, okay? Right? But going to Lipschitz sort of, for one thing, is it's a, no, it's a reasonable notion of complexity. And also, if I know the Lipschitz constant, then I really could go ahead and put the function into a computer to any dis to any particular degree of precision, okay? Because let's just think about it. I have, a, say, a map from an interval, you know, uh, in, in, into, a, into a computer. I, no, a map from an interval into a space, okay? And I want, okay? And, you know, I decided I want to, you know, measure this up to point 0.1, right? That point 0.1 is the level of precision I want. So if I know a Lipschitz constant is less than is L, so then if I space my points at less than 0.1 over L apart, knowing the values at those points is good enough. So the amount of data I need, well, it depends a little bit on the target. <coughs> I have to have sort of good addresses for every point in the, in the target, right? Where it is that I'm going to imagine that my, you know, okay, there needs to be a picture for every sentence, right? So I'm going to subdivide it. And each of these points, I'll imagine, goes to some specific point inside of the target, right? Because I'll round to within point 0.05, okay? And then, you know, all the points that are in between here, I'll just interpolate any which way, and that will really tell me the function to within this level of precision, okay? So that actually goes ahead and solves this question. Right, so now, when I've told you how many bins you need when you want to put it into a computer, that was exactly this problem of, you know, of trying to estimate the size of this function space. Okay, 
right? I mean, that's what, you know, so, I mean, we've taken the abstract Arzela Scoli, and we, we realize what makes, what makes it work is that, you know, and, you know, is this kind, you know, it's exactly this issue of bins and that you know how, you know, how much, how well to space these points. Okay, so what you learn here is that maps from the interval into X, you know, sort of, let me say, the volume of this is exponential in L, right? Because what's the point? When I know the Lipschitz constant L, then I have to space my points at the scale divided by L. I pick the scale once and for all, like pi or whatever the number is. Right? But then, you know, the L is in the denominator, and when I want to fill the interval with points, you know, it grows, it's like O of L, and there are finitely many targets within the space X, so that's the base of the exponential. And that will tell me, you know, that's, that, that's sort of some overkill, okay? Okay, now, by the way, is this, um, okay? And the same thing, of course, works, you know, no matter which one-dimensional uh, domain I put here, right? If I put it the circle, I could also, at scale L, you know, need L points for measuring things. And, you know, for the case of the circle, this is a thing that people in geometric group theory study, they call it the growth of the fundamental group, right? These spaces, set of components form a group, that's, you know, and by the growth of the group, they say you imagine that you express the group in terms of generators, and you ask if you have a word of length L, Right? That's going to be around what the Lipschitz constant is of a, a map from the circle representing that word, if you use Van Kampen's theorem or some normalization. And then you ask how many elements of the group are represented by that. That's the number of homotopy classes. So this is something that's a little bit more refined. Uh, you know, we, we now said something geometric that reflects the fact that a finitely generated group always has at worst exponential growth. Okay? Now, this translation, of course, also tells me that if I looked at the special case where x was um, the union of two circles along a point, right, a figure eight, so in this case, we know the fundamental group, okay, and the fundamental group is what's called a free group on two generators, okay, and it's, you know, elements of length L are just, you know, words, non-commutative words involving A and B that are of length L, the number of those does grow exponentially in L, and I could imagine a map from the circle to this that, you know, follows that as, as it's, you know, as, right? So, we, so, uh, this, so that tells us that this is, in, in fact, the, the exactly correct estimate. Okay? Right? So that if we have a one, right? Right? So do you see the logic? Right? On the one hand, right, we, we argued, you know, uh, I don't know what to say, an approximation theoretically that there was an exponential upper bound, and then the lower bound comes straight from algebraic topology, right? That those things can't be deformed to each other no matter how much you increase the Lipschitz constant, right? I mean, that, that was sort of the, that was the upshot of, of this discussion, okay? And uh, now what happens if instead of having an, oh, something one-dimensional, suppose I would have put in SN, something n-dimensional, okay, right, I mean, right? So, well, it's exactly the same reasoning. I mean, I told you what we have to do. We have to think about how, den how, do, I, how do I pack points within the two-sphere such that everything is within whatever the scale is determined by the target, right? The scale of the target divided by L, Right? And then I would be able to put in, that would be enough data to, to, to put the space in for a computer. Okay? And I, what I get is, it will be exponential now in L to the D. D is n? Uh, D is n, yes. Okay. It's exponential in L to the n. Okay? So what happens is, if you have a higher dimensional domain, okay, still... It's a good, you know, the Lipschitz constant is a good complexity notion. Okay, so we're happy about it. And it's not just our Zela Scoli that, that something or other is finite. Okay, now we even have something, you know, that is, you know, no computer scientist would be happy with something that's only slightly super exponential. But as mathematicians, you know, we have no choice but to, but, you know, to live with this level of, of dissatisfaction. Okay. Yeah. If you 
saying this this is an upper bound? This is an upper bound. Oh, now why, why, why is it a lower bound? So I also should do a little piece of algebraic topology to do that. So I will, but I, let me do it, um, but I'll do it fast so that for people who don't want to follow it, uh, you know, they could think about, you know, Shmuel should have really dressed better for these lectures or, you know, there might be something or other that you could think about. So, okay, so I'm going to look at the maps from, say, S2 to um, I'm going to imagine a torus, and then I attach an S2 on top. Okay, and uh, there's a map from this to this. I mean, of okay, the torus is R2 mod Z2, as we've discussed. But what what I should map is putting a balloon at every integer. Started one minute ago, so it's not. Oh. oh, all right. I, oh, it says it's okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. I'm saying that proves. Oh, yeah, yeah, and therefore the Riemann hypothesis holds <laughs> in full generality. Uh, <laughs> okay, so did everyone follow that? <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, so so, the, so anyway, so this gives you an example. Um, which, by the way, it's sort of remarkable because, you know, I mean, you could have tried to do this with a three torus and then you would have L cubed lattice points and you would have imagined you could have gotten exponential and L cubed, right? But, you know, uh, so you should think about, uh, well, well, yeah, so how, you know, so obviously you can't do it, you know, with one pancake, do all the L cubed things, but maybe you tilt it in different ways. You know, I mean, this, me the method of algebraic topology, you definitely feel like, oh, okay, he gave exponential and L squared examples, but he also did like 0% of what's available, you know. So it's really shocking that the crude computer science upper bound, you know, matches the algebraic topology lower bound. If you're going to be the kind of person who's so crude and say it's exponential and L squared is, a, is the right scale of answer, right? I mean, you're not keeping track of the base of exponentials. You know, I mean, just working at the right level of crudity, uh, you know, I mean, you know, sometimes is, is helpful, you know, okay. okay? So anyway, so yeah, so this really is right. Okay, so this really is the end. So, you know, my goal for today's talk was to explain why entropy would be a good thing, right? So what, is it, what would it mean to understand algebraic topology, you know, a la Dirac? It would mean that, firstly, if I, you know, it would mean that if algebraic topology tells me that two functions are homotopic, I should be able to find the homotopy or something like that. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, at the moment, we're not quite doing that, but you know, we're, it's, it's maybe not so far apart, right? Because we now have pick, found a fairly dense set of functions near each other, and you know, we could see, you know, we, we could begin exploring it, and we will now have a finite graph. Okay. So what becomes the question about? Uh, okay. So okay. Oh, you know what? I, 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 so, so now I want to mention a, a, a great theorem. So what happens, by the way, uh, for the maps from Sn to Sn? Okay, right? So we know that it's classified by the degree. So for, if you want to have a definition of the degree, make your function, assume your function is smooth, and then you just take a generic point and you count the number of inverse images that point has. And if you count them with sign according to the, the sign of the Jacobian matrix, that, you know, that number is independent of which point you choose in the target. Okay, and that's the degree of the map. Okay? So what happens when we do this algebraic topology? So I to explained to you that that estimate is right in general. But what about for Sn to Sn? Okay? Well, I mean, it's the right size. We've gotten the entropy correct. Right? I mean, you know, the size of the function space isn't going to be changing because the algebraic topology is different. Okay? I mean, and I'll let you think about that. Well, you know, I mean, if you like, you could map the, well, I'll, you could think about it yourself, that even though um, the algebraic topology that I said isn't good enough, I mean, it's, you could find a subset of the function space that grows that size, okay, by algebraic topology methods. Okay? But, if the Lipschitz constant is less than or equal to L, then the degree of F, the Lipschitz constant of F, is in fact less than L to the N. Now, this is not obvious from the definition I gave. Okay? I mean, it's, it's a true fact. But, and the easiest way to see it is, to, is if for people who know, instead of just taking a point, what you do is you average over all points. And what does that mean? That means you're looking at the volume of the manifold and you're pulling it back and you're integrating what the volume is. Now when you do that, oh, you're pulling back a volume form, then you could compute this using calculus. And you realize that um, it's, it, the worst is amount. You look at the Jacobian matrix, not the Jacobian derivative, right? You, you look at the differential and you just look at what the largest eigenvalue is and that's at most L. That's what this Lipschitz information is. So if the largest eigenvalue is at most L, then the whole determinant is, and every, is point-wise at most L to the N. Okay? So calculus tells us this. Okay? So, so that's sort of one you know, miracle of algebraic topology, right? Even though the number of components should, feels like it should be exponential in L to the N. That's all that abstract nonsense gives us. And for general targets, that's the best you can have. Uh, so I, this seems like a good minute because I'm over time anyway. Is I'll, the theorem um, that uh, Gromov published in the 70s, and then he asked in the 90s if it's true. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, Manon and I uh, published a paper saying, "Yeah," uh, which is that if y is simply connected, then uh, the number of components of the function space represented by things with Lipschitz less than L is polynomially bounded. Okay, the degree of the, I mean, and you know, Manon did some very nice examples where it turns out it's asymptotically L to a rational number. I mean, it's not. I mean, it turns out not to always be a simple story. You know, how to figure out what this growth is. So, um, so this is, if you like, what? 
um, x is any finite complex and y is simply connected, then this, then this thing turns out to, so, there, so there's some miracle here. And I'm going to say this is, the mir this is a miracle of algebraic topology. It goes down to the work of Serre, ultimately the work of Serre on spectral sequences. Um, but it, you know, all of that fancy algebraic topology turns out to be somewhat computable after the fact. And this is what I will have to explain some of the, you know, remove some of the mir miracle from this, right? That this algebraic topology hypothesis tells you that something that in theory should be super exponential is actually polynomial. Okay, right? So that's some, you know, that's I think a substantial piece of good news. But it isn't good enough for us. So I'm going to set now the stage for the next two talks, right? So uh, what we really want to know, though, is if I have two things that, right, this is telling me if I have two guys, they're going to be homotopic. So that means that I could find a path through the whole function space, right? But through the whole function space means that the Lipschitz constant could be growing supercomputably in principle. And when y is non-simply connected, it turns out there's no way to avoid that if you would be having a y whose fundamental group has unsolvable word problem. So, and that is sort of the, the, the source of some of these phenomena number two in the, in, in the theorem I mentioned. Okay? That sometimes you, you know, the complexity grows uncomputably. So uh, we need some methods that you know, tell us that the, you know, what's the relationship between a space at one level of complexity to a higher level. Okay, so we're going to have filtrations of spaces and understand the relations of what goes from one to the other. And that's what persistent homology is about. Okay. And then in the last time, well, right, I mean, right, you don't, when you want to go between Haifa and Jerusalem, you, you're not even interested in knowing about, is there a thing where you never go above 3,000, uh, you know, meters above, you know, right? You're not just interested in, in, during the course of a path, how complex was it at any moment, right? You really want to know how long it's going to take, right? So you're not interested in the components of function spaces. You need to know something or other about the diameters. Okay? And that's sort of missing also from the traditional algebraic topology, but it's part of what the picture is. We should really take, so the, basically what I'm trying to do in all of these lectures is take seriously function spaces as being genuine spaces that you're going to do measurements of if you feel like you want to understand them. So today I was focusing on volume. Tomorrow I'll talk about what this filtration looks like. Okay, and that's what this persistent homology is about. And then in the last time, I'm going to talk about the d diameter, right? And, you know, that's something that you need to know, that even when you, will you, know, you insist that you're not going to go about, you know, above two kilometers above uh, sea level, still, how long is the path that connects one to the other? Because that you really need to do when you want to translate the, what algebraic topologists will do. They'll say that f is homotopic to g, and then you do all this magic in other parts of mathematics where you make use of that. But it turns out that all the magic in the other parts of mathematics doesn't just use the answer. It, they actually say, well, you take a homotopy and you do something or other to it. So that means you have to understand the homotopies, which means that you have to understand the diameter. So that's the rest. So you've, you've heard it all already. So, uh, you know, so I, I won't be insulted if people choose not to come back. OK, anyway, thank you. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. You, you should wait for the preprint. <laughs> yeah. When you consider families of metrics, uh, is it related to, let's say, conformal families or clothes? Yeah, so that was sort of uh, what, what, one of the things that was in back of my mind. Uh, you know, there are lots of good theorems in geometry, you know, where people pr construct metrics and what they do is, you know, what's good is measured, you know, say, one way of measuring what's good is you measure how good something is, and then you say, good means the best. Okay, and then how do you get to the best? Well, you start where you are and then you follow a gradient or the negative of the gradient of, of your measurement of how good you are. And then, you know, all of a sudden you've changed your problem about, uh, you know, how should I live my life to, you know, um, proving the existence of solutions of some nonlinear differential equation, right? I mean, which, 
My rabbi never told me that. That's how I figured out. But anyway, right? But so that is a method, right? And there are lots of theorems that are proven by the, this method. And the question is, can you? Um, and in fact, a lot of the original interest in positive scalar curvature uh, was coming out of the Yamabe problem. That was exactly something of that sort. And I mean, so the logic is a little bit inverted. I mean, you're interested in such inequalities uh, in order to prove long-term existence of solutions. But it does but uh, so one, one thing that was interesting to me is that all of these results about positive scalar curvature weren't proved by any kind of variational methods. And the question is, could there be a proof by, by, such, by, by such methods? And this, you know, this says that if there would be such a proof, it would have to be extremely different from anything that we, that we, that we know about. OK? And uh, let me just comment a word about the proofs that occur in Gromov, Lawson, uh, and Stoltz. And what they do is they, there's some essential moment in their, in their proof where they don't study metrics on the manifold M. They study metrics on manifolds that are cobordant to M. OK? So they leave, you know, so, uh, you know, so they leave the original function space in which they live, so to speak, and solve the problem somewhere else. And, it, and um, you know, and so that's sort of a, a philosophically amazing thing. And, you know, I mean, and the same kinds of things occur in analysis as well. That's right. Sometimes you want to try, show the existence of solutions of a certain sort. And then you go from, ellipt, you know, from operators to pseudo differential operators, or you leave your function space into things with other regularity. And, you know, and every time you do this, it raises these kind of questions about how complicated is the step where you've enlarged your point of view in order to make existence easier. And then, right, the typical thing you do is you do existence becomes easier, and then you have to prove a violem or you have to prove a regularity theorem. Right, you have to do something, something extra. Right, so it makes the existence easier, and then it, but then there's the part of relating it to the universe in which you live, and then that becomes the harder point. So uh, the tensions in the theorems, ha you know, are actually relating the difference between <laughs> diffeomorphism and cobordism in some philosophical way. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah. So I would say that, yeah, the point of these things is specific, you know, it doesn't actually give information about variational problems. I've never succeeded uh, in getting non-trivial information about uh, about existence of solutions to variational problems, although I've tried. Uh, but what this does is it sort of makes, it indicates that some problems probably are not approachable by variational methods. Okay, but I think. Okay, so um, we'll resume at uh, 12 tomorrow. We'll have drinks and snacks before then. So let's make the. Okay. Trouble with this risk-kidding argument.